Welcome to Podcast with Smart, brought to you by Start with Smart. I'm Shana, your host, and I'm joined by company owners Scott Simpson and Scott Dunn. Join us as we uncover the world of smart home automation and security. Whether you're a homeowner or a business, Podcast with Smart has the tips and trends you need to make your homes and businesses smarter and safer. Let's get to it, shall we? Welcome back to episode two. Episode two. Episode yes. two. It's been a long road. Been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode we're going to talk about some smart tech security system news. We'll start off with something that happened quite recently. It was a couple of weeks ago in the US. Um, so an escaped killer was recaptured following a really tense manhunt um, after he set off a burglar alarm. The alarm alerted the authorities to his location, enabling them to get him and bring an end to the situation and ensuring the safety of the community. What are the benefits of intruder burglar alarm systems and remote monitoring? Well, there are several. Capturing, yeah. capturing escaped criminals on the run, it appears. That would be, uh, yeah. yeah. You hope at the very <laughs> least the biggest get that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting story, isn't yeah. it? I think, um, yeah. he, what did he say, two weeks he'd been on the run? Was it two yeah, weeks? Yeah, about two weeks. So he'd evaded capture. For two long. weeks, so he'd had a pretty good run. Yeah, to be fair. That's not a bad effort, is it really? No. And then in comes the uh, intruder alarm system. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, because it's not, it's not something we see in this country so much, but they sent up a, uh, an aircraft that was to, as a response to the intruder alarm, not necessarily for something that was looking for him, and it just so happened they found him at the same time. No, so I think they were, they, were in, no, they, were searching the, they were searching the area for him. So they were already in the area searching for him because they had intel that he was in that area. So they had a team of people there looking for him. Mm. And then an alarm was alerted in that area. A home intruder alarm system was yeah. was the, set off in yeah. that area at the same time. Yeah. So that enabled them to zoom in their focus in that area. And then they sent the sent the aircraft up. We don't know whether mm. it was a we don't know if it was in a helicopter or a drone or anything, yeah. do we? But um, the thermal imaging camera is, I think, what they used. Yeah, it was. The, yeah, yeah. They, uh, yeah, they managed to find, they managed to find the heat mm. source in and around that mm. area where the alarm had gone off, and just crazy yeah, landed, landed the capture. Yeah, it's a very, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, it's, an underutilized tool, I think, in quite a lot of industries. I think the um, thermal imaging had a quick heyday amongst the pandemic time when people were being screened for temperatures and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. But other than that, it was sort of, yeah, uh, it kind of came and went. Hikvision bought out that dedicated camera, didn't they? They did, yeah. Like a desktop. Wasn't it like, a, it was quite a big thing, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, it's like a facial video, camera rig with a whole sort of like thermal like heat from And they were placing that in. above doors. The idea yeah. was to place it above yeah. the entrance of a, yeah. of a shop and it would scan yeah. the temperatures of people before they entered the shop. And didn't I see, if I remember rightly, didn't it have like a red and green light on it? Something like that, yeah. I'm sure I've seen some. I don't know if they, I don't know if it was the Hit Vision camera specifically, but some of the some of the cameras were either you know green to pass, red to stop, depending mm. on the temperature. It read off the individual waiting to come in. Yeah, if you weren't cool enough, you're not allowed in. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Story. Yeah, it was analysing yeah. your analysing <laughs> analysing your your wear, <laughs> your attire. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't see too many of them out. No, no, no. Thank God. It was, a, it was an interesting product. It was but, an yeah. expensive one. I think it's a. Uh, but yeah, I certainly would like to see more thermal imaging. It's something that we haven't touched too much on, but we've um, there's not many uh, use cases it. for it, really, is there? That we that we've that we've come into. You know, there's not many use cases mm. that we've you know, none of our clients or customers so far have had a need for it at all. No, the slightest of inquiries no. our way about thermal imaging. No. But we did see that product. We were talking about it the other week, weren't we? With the um, fire detection cameras. Yeah, which. Um, for all intents and purposes, they look, just look like a normal camera. You fit them the same. They don't look too mm. dissimilar to a normal camera, do they? No. But the software inside the camera is actually programmed to identify a fire. And I think it was something like five, mm. wasn't it like five? It, it, program, it captures most fires within like five seconds or something. Something yeah. crazy. Which is really quick. Yeah. When you imagine like, obviously fire detection systems serve that purpose. So um, in a, relatively confined space like say this you know podcast room we're in now you'll have a detector on the ceiling when if a fire broke out here the smoke would reach that detector relatively quickly because it's a small space mm. but when you think about like chemical storage or outside storage you know maybe uh you know oil refinery or something like that mm. um well for a start if you don't have a ceiling where do you put a detector 
because the smoke's just going to go into the atmosphere yeah. straight away. So actually, look, a thermal imaging camera mm. focused on an area that's programmed to identify the flames and raise the alarm is actually a really good... It's a clever solution, isn't it? Very clever solution, yeah. I, I guess mean... it'd be handy also on sort of farms if you've got, um, say, a chicken coop and yeah. foxes, you can kind of notice where the foxes are coming from and then the security around the coops. Yeah. It could be a beneficial thing for Very agriculture. much. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I have fires and outbuildings too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the farms we work on, a lot of the, a lot of you know, a lot of the um, concerns that the farmers have about the high value of stock or, um, you know, animals in outbuildings and being able to just monitor that is is their biggest difficulty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it would be a good use case there actually as well. Mm. I think we just stumbled across that actually. Shane, yeah. I think Shane has yeah. brought that to the table. Marketing brain. It's brilliant. Yeah, no, it's, it, I think speed is speed is the the main aim with most of these types of products because it's uh, especially when you start adding monitoring into that because it's it's, it's the it's the um, minimizing the the reaction time minimizes the the impact, which in turn minimizes the damage and the cost, and there's a sort of a never-ending circle there. So when you when you've got products like that, intruder alarms, CCTV, and fire alarms, and that it needs to work almost immediately, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. being able to, you know, even in a domestic sort of circumstance where you've got a, an intruder alarm system, for that to work the minute somebody's crawled through the window and have the monitoring service phoning you up within sort of a minute to let you know that that's happened is, so, you know, it's. Uh, Invaluable. It does seem to be, doesn't it, that most of the design principles of these systems, mm. actually, a, a lot of it is geared towards effective, mm. effective raising of the alarm in a you know in a fast fast manner. Mm. But when when you say monitoring, then um, obviously when you know say you take a take say you take like an oil refinery for example, and you've got some of these cameras outside, um, the monitor in that scenario would be different for the monitoring of a farmer, or would it? Yes and no. The principal way you would monitor it would be not too dissimilar. The technology doesn't vary that much. It would be who's doing it where. Um, things like oil rigs and stuff, if they've got access to the internet, then they may have a central station of part of that company that monitors yeah. their alarms and stuff on a global scale in a control room. But you know, for smaller companies and stuff, they, they may outsource that to a, an alarm receiving centre. Mm, yes, yeah, so that's an important thing to know. The monitoring... Mm as a feature is sort of um, inherent to the product, right? It's there. It's pretty universal. It, it's got that yeah. function. It can be leveraged, but depending on the application might be depend on where it might would depend on where the monitoring yeah. actually takes place. So on a small scale that might be self monitored through sort of smart app notifications. Yeah. You can do it yourself, yeah. Whereas in a bigger place it may be a, a dedicated security guard or something in a in a station that that monitors Control room, from, yeah, that's not, yeah. not too uh, not a too uncommon thing. Is to you know, especially when you've got like industrial estates uh, that are owned by bigger companies and large warehouse areas that have a security team on site. Places like universities and stuff, they're classic for having a security team on site. They monitor it all. They don't. It doesn't go out to to anyone else. Yeah, so quite often yeah. they'll, they'll if any alarms go off, fire alarms as well. They'll manage that in house before any outbound. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, services get called in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? I suppose the mm-hmm. chances of false alarm in places are oh, very high. high. Very high, Very yeah. high, yeah. Mm. You know, 10,000 students and uh, one of them's going to push it at one point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love students. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, so we'll stay in the UK for the next bit of news. It's quite an important <clears throat> one. Um, PSTN. So PSTN yes. stands for Public Switched Telephone Network. Um, Boom. Correct. Um, <laughs> I've been training on that one for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, which is found in most homes and businesses. Um, it is indeed. Especially with your landlines mm-hmm. and alarms and things like that. Um, so the traditional landline network, PTSN, will be decommissioned in December of 2025. Um, Just around the corner. Yeah. Which, it's their own target. Which means transitioning about 14 million lines to internet-based connections. OpenReach has initiated the switchover, ensuring existing phones and numbers remain usable, albeit through different backend systems. This, so this change poses values and challenges, um, ensuring things like emergency call access, fire alarms, um, traffic lights, burglar alarms, 
and they all depend on PTSN and they've all got to adapt. How will this affect us, um, homes and businesses? Oh, good question. I mean, it's been it's been spoken about quite a while, actually, this switchover. It it's has, been, It's yeah. been in the pipeline for quite a long time. Um, and it's already happening, um, particularly in homes, actually. A lot of a lot of areas now um, are connected to what you would call respectable internet speeds. Um, and you may have noticed if you've upgraded your broadband um, at all in the last 12 months that they are um, offering you a VoIP phone connection at the same time and it's optional whereas mm. um, historically it's always been a case of you need a phone line a phone service for your broadband to run on on top of that yeah so it's switched doesn't it you may have noticed that and then on the router they provide you they've actually got a telephone port connection on the router rather than um, on the wall like it has been historically that is the switch over basically what's happening there is the router is holding a VoIP account and it's got the port on the back for your phone to plug into and your phone uses that VoIP to make the call, which is handled over the internet rather than down the um, phone line. Um, so it is happening and nine times out of ten, it's not really affecting anyone. Most people don't really use their landlines anymore. Uh, most people have a phone in their pocket and they're unfortunate yeah. to be in a place where they have good phone signal. Um, but we do have some customers. We support a lot of customers in remote areas. Because we do a lot of we do, we do a lot of um, sort of alternative broadband connections where people uh, say they're in a little parish somewhere. Um, there's only a small small collection of houses in that area. Well, open reach aren't in a rush to connect those small parishes up to the fastest broadband because the number of subscribers in that particular area is low. So the return on investment just ultimately is appealing. Yeah. So. What they're doing is they're picking the, what they're seemingly doing anyway, is picking the towns and cities with larger populations, deploying their networks in those areas first to, to get the statistics and targets that they're trying to reach quicker. Um, but it does leave a lot of people in rural areas on, on substandard internet connections speeds. I mean, we, we, we transfer a lot of people from sort of sub two meg download yeah. speed, um, Terrible, yeah. which is, you know, one email an hour. <laughs> barely, enough to, barely enough to stream a video. Yeah. Um, and because they're in remote locations, the cellular signal is quite often non-existent. So when you think about how that might sort of pan out in the, the event of an emergency, if, if the power went down, traditionally you've always been able to pick up the phone and your hardwired landline phone is powered from the exchange rather than from inside your house. So you've always been able to make a call, but with this switchover, that's not necessarily going to be mm. be the case. And we have had a few few of our clients inquire specifically on that because they're mm. worried. They're worried about where that leaves them in the event of an emergency. You know, it's not a nice thought, is it, if something goes wrong no. in the middle of nowhere? No. Not being able to contact anyone. No. But uh, interestingly, um, Shana here <laughs> um, shared a link with us to read before the mm. podcast. And... Um, on that link, it did mention that the ISPs now have plans to include battery backup with the routers that they supply um, for VoIP connection. So if the power did go down, in theory, you could have 12 to 24 hours runtime of power in your internet broadband router mm -hmm. and you would still be able to make a call, which I think is really important. I think that's a really good step from them to acknowledge that and keep that in place. As I say, a lot of people are not reliant on that anymore but there are still enough people out there that are yeah i think with yeah. things like particularly la alarms they're not they're not always just fire alarms or burglar alarms they're also call alarms in like disabled toilets and things yeah. like that that yeah yeah it's i think those are the ones that are going to be affected the most by the switchover um so it'd be interesting to see what plans yeah. are in place to make sure that those safety features are, are prioritised. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a city network issue, doesn't mm. it? Um, yeah, we're reading up on, on that a little bit, and it was things like traffic lights as well, wasn't it? And it seems like there's a lot of... And up, up until very recently, I haven't really thought about how much stuff out there in the city might actually be connected to the internet. I didn't, there's, weirdly, that's yeah. never really crossed my mind. Yeah. I love all things there's, gadgets and connected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you kind of don't think about it, but yeah, little things, like even like... Um, you know, like fall alarm systems for the elderly when they're at home. That's all. That's 
straight into the you know that's not telephone on the broadband line, that's yeah. on the telephone line like you said the traffic lights um you know that's all they're on a little in the cabinets on the roadside that's all copper telephone lines quite a lot of it all the road traffic lights and all of the um all of the highways cameras a lot of those are still copper lines with a little modem mm. i think the 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 real difference the, the real difference is <coughs> whether or not the the, you can make that communication in the event of a local power outage. Mm. I think that's where the, the main difference is because uptimes of broadband statistics versus the uptime of telephone line statistics. There's no difference. There's no difference in the in the two really. The, the broadband can run on one core of a two core connection, and the telephone line can't. So mm. I think you're you're no worse off having a broadband connection, but it's waiting for that innovation of of you know, manufacturers to make the next wave of products that are going to connect over an internet connection rather than a phone yeah. connection and whether or not that aligns yeah. nicely with the, the time of switchover, I suppose. Yeah. Is what's there are, we've been looking, haven't we, at a few different bits and pieces and we've generally not installed anything that relies on the phone line anyway. I mean, we kind of avoid that. We, we, we aim for more towards the IP and the more modern sort of smart technology. Um, so with our alarms and stuff like that, they all rely on like IP and 4G. Same with the fire alarms. Um, and I think the existing customers that we have got um, that are still using their main sort of um, analog phone systems, we've been looking at some products to allow for them to connect their analog phone system into a sort of separate VoIP exchange, if you like, so that they can use their... Um, they can use their analog phones because some people's phone systems are quite complex, aren't they? Especially in larger properties, we've they've seen quite, a lot of them. quite a lot. Of yeah, them, we you do see they've got you know by the time you sort of add up all of the information, you know they've got two or three sort of base stations because their houses, the walls are a meter thick, and then five or six different phones. Yeah. And to replace that all with VoIP is a well, it's incredibly expensive. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's certainly a, an investment where you can just put a little converter and it will drop the gun. Yeah. Switch that. So it's that new VoIP mm. connection into the old analog phones, yeah. and away you go. But I mean, we are seeing more and more with, <coughs> with these remote locations that they're, um, they're, people are more inclined to do away with a phone line connection altogether, move on to something like Starlink or four G to give them that yeah. fast internet, and then you know they're, we're moving them on to you know, some of these people run businesses and Airbnbs from their farmhouses as well, and they want to keep retain their landline number, but obviously the minute they let that subscription go. You know, if they don't take steps to keep that number, then it just disappears into the ether and re- yeah. reallocate it somewhere eventually. But um, we can actually move people's numbers into a VoIP system online and people can have phone connections for inbound calls for about £4 a month. So in terms, of, really. in terms of the cost and how accessible and available it is, it, it's sort of there. It just needs a bit of technical, technical know-how to... Sort of navigate all the different details because, um, yeah, there's a lot of information out there, and a lot of different options. Yeah, it can get quite messy, can't it, if you don't understand the uh, the process. Let's talk smart homes. Yeah, your, your favourite topic. Um, Give you a shout if we need you, mate. I've got to put the kettle on. <laughs> so, smart homes, whilst offering convenience, are becoming hotspots for hacker attacks. Um, Hackers are everywhere. Which obviously can compromise privacy and data um, and it's really crucial to navigate mm. the digital age with an emphasis on securing networks and devices just to make sure that our private spaces remain just that private yeah how common is hacking with your customers either before they come to you or whilst they're with you never see it really no nice never see it no. we hear about it through forums and networks we sort of we do yeah we, we're yeah. in and around don't we like Facebook communities of other installers and integrators and stuff, yeah. and we do you, you hear hear rumbles of it, but yeah, no first hand experience, and even the rumbles no. we do hear are very few and far between. I think no, it's it's something that is well known in principle can happen and can be exploited. Um, however, as Scott alluded to a little bit earlier, it takes a lot of technical know how to to find these exploit, uh, exploits and even if you find them nine times out of ten a good manufacturer will patch them very quickly very quickly and before it's been exploited 
on a wide you know on a, on a wide basis has actually been patched and it's no longer available to exploit mm. um, but again in, in similar to what we said on CCTV earlier there's ways that you can deploy systems to tip the odds in your favor where that's concerned and a, a good example is having say a device or a smart home principle based on IOT um, Internet of Things, so things like um, Amazon Alexa's, um, you know, your Philips Hughes and stuff. All of those integrations require an internet connectivity in order to function for the smart features. So the communications between platforms, it happens in the cloud. Um, so if a connection goes outbound to the internet, then you, by default, increase your vulnerability to, to attack. Um, but I would still say the, the probability is very slim, very slim. Um, and it still is the case of things like recklessness with password choice and stuff like that and sharing those details in places you shouldn't is the vast majority of exploits that happen. But um, it is possible. And I think it's just important to note that whenever a connection goes outwards to the internet, that it increases your chances of vulnerability to attack. But if you design a system like we use, something like Lockzone, um, you can have all of your systems functioning, controlling your smart home, and it doesn't need any outbound communication to the internet to do that. Um, it becomes an optional luxury. It's not paramount to the way that it functions. It's built that way on purpose, actually, um, to give that peace of mind to people that have that sort of solution, um, which, is, which is really nice. And that's one of the biggest things that stood out to me when we chose that product to be our sort of champion product, product if you like, was the fact that your internet can go down. Um, there can be an, a known exploit. You can just disconnect the internet to it. It's gonna work as it did with all that, that internet connection. And for me, that's a massive pro. So obviously we've touched on passwords and making sure you don't share them and make sure they're not password one, two, three, or something that you've used for everything, making sure different things have different passwords. Um, what else can customers do to maintain a safe network? A few different things. I think the password, the biggest one, like you said, is the passwords. I think having a little bit of knowledge around the internet and phishing scams and um, knowing what a bad link looks like um, and a little bit of education in and around sort of that kind of web, you know, navigating the web in a safe manner can go a long way. Um, a lot of emails people get and email scams, you know, they'll look exactly like the email that you would normally get from your bank. There's only a few telltale signs, but knowing what they are can save you thousands and having your card details stolen. It's, um, you know, using the web in a safe manner. And there's, there's plenty of courses and um, guides and stuff out there that are run generally free by different yeah, places as well that you can go yeah. to. and. You know, they'll teach you how to navigate the web in a safe manner. You know, even for people that may not be sort of tech savvy and, you know, people that are a little bit older and, you know, a bit afraid of it. It still it's, happens over the phone, right? It still happens over the phone, yeah. You, yeah it's not exclusive know. to digital. It's not an no. exclusively digital problem. Yeah. No. It's, um, you know, people phone scammers ring up and get bank details off people all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's an unfortunate yeah, it's truth, terrible, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. Unfortunate truth, I think. Yeah. yeah, and that Nigerian prince still hasn't paid me. <laughs> <laughs> You keep waiting, mate. Don't give up hope. <laughs> he wants more money. <laughs> but the more you invest, the bigger the return. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's just too good to turn down. You're doing the right thing. Mate. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably, probably is. is yeah. If you're unsure, end the call and then call that yeah. company back via a different phone no number to check. And yeah. also speak to your younger family members. I mean, Gen Z are particularly tech savvy. And so if you're having issues with things like changing passwords or mm. storing data in a safe way, because there are things that can help you store your password safely. Um, Google's one is another thing called one password. Um, and that, you know, that means you just have to remember one password and it will remember all the others. So you can have all the automatic, weird, just random letters that are the super safe ones. Um, but your younger family members can definitely yeah. help you out. I think you, I think you owe an apology to every young family member out there. Do you realise what you've just said? <laughs> <laughs> every eight-year-old niece That's and nephew cool. now is I furious. Not, <laughs> I, would not, I would not wish that on my worst enemy, honestly. 
as someone who supports various family members through technical <laughs> difficulties, uh, I used to have hair. <laughs> Hi, present day Shana here. We're going to make this episode a two-parter, so check back next week for part two. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Podcast for Smart. Don't forget to connect with us on social media for a closer look into the work we do. And if you're eager for more exciting podcast content, be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button. Stay smart and stay connected.